Well, let's pray before we start. Father, Lord, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you that we are your children. Father, we thank you that we have your word. Father, help us believe your word. Lord, be with us today. It's such a privilege to come and worship you with all these brethren. Please be with us. Lord, let us hear your words as not words of man, not words coming from me, but your words, Lord. It's your Bible that we preach. Help us, Father, we pray. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, um, I've desired to speak about sexual immorality. And I, because it's a good subject or topic to speak about, but because uh, I am burdened and I've, I, there's this verse in Ephesians that don't turn there that explains why we should all be burdened. I'll read. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. My focus here is on sexual immorality. This is what the Bible says, that it should not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. And I want to particularly focus on pornography. You know, while preparing, I was uh, looking at some stats. And uh, just for one website, there is 80,000, I think, views per minute. That's pornography on one website. You can imagine from the time I start now to the time I finish, there's going to be ha close to half a million people who viewed pornography. And this is not proper among the saints. And that's why I am burdened, and that's why we should all be burdened. But turn with me in 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. We'll focus on, uh, we'll read from verse 1 to verse 8. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what, is inst what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, the fact that sexual immorality should not be named among us does not mean that sexual immorality is not a reality. Pornography is a reality. And it's unfortunately a reality in this church, among the saints, that it should not be. 
Now, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. And the Thessalonians, from what we can see here, they don't have this problem. Because look at verse 1. He says, Brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. So they are walking in a way that pleases God. And Paul is only asking and urging them to do so more and more. Keep walking in a way that pleases God. And this is very important. I think if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you know that this is a fight. You know, Peter says that these passions that wage war against our soul, we cannot be neutral about sin. And in this case, we cannot be neutral about sexual immorality. I think it's Jesse Ryan who said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. So as we can tell here, the Thessalonians are walking well, and he tells them to do so more and more. This, I guess I should also say that the address here is to all of us, not just those who are falling into this sin, but all of us. Are you walking well? Have you been set free from pornography? Are you not lasting? The Bible says, do so more and more. Do not think that you're safe. Do not sit down, watch, and pray, because the flesh is weak. Verse 3, he says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, I think this is a famous verse. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And I don't think I have to spend a lot of time here, but there is a verse, there is three words I want to focus on. This is the will of God. What is the will of God? Your sanctification. Now here, we may interpret this, this phrase as meaning God wills, God desires. You know, this, this word here is, is uh, translated somewhere else as desire. So you can say God desires your sanctification, but does God only desire? Is it optional that we are sanctified? Do some Christians abstain from sexual immorality and others don't? Is that okay? Obviously, it's not. And I don't have to spend a lot of time proving that to you guys because I trust God and I praise God that we are in a church. We are not antinomians here. And if you don't know what antinomian is, it's pretty much sin, however you like, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is the will of God? I looked up this, this exact word in other places that it's used. And I'll read, you don't have to turn there, but Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, all will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father. This will of my father is the same will of my God here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter, but those who does the will of my Father. Another verse, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And the world is passing away along with its desire, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Do you see a pardon? The will of God is an optional. You conform to it or you face the wrath of God. So we've got, we've got to do the will of God. And, but what is the will of God in this case? It's your sanctification. And another famous ver verse in Hebrew says, strive for holiness without which no one will do what? Will see the Lord. The same word holiness here is the same word translated as, as sanctification here. Strive for sanctification, in this case, abstaining from sexual immorality without which no one will see the Lord. So this is not optional. To Christians, it's not optional. Now, verse 4 and 5. That each one of you 
know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now you can see in verse 4, Paul says that each one of you know how to control his own body. And the NIV does a very bad job because it says each one of you learn how to control. That the word learn is not there. There is an expectation here that we should know. We should already know how to control our own bodies in holiness. And verse 5 says, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now, we've seen that the will of God is our sanctification. And specifically, in this case, abstaining from sexual immorality. And to bring it even more home is abstain from pornography. I think that's a big problem in this day and even in this church, unfortunately. And Paul says, and we've seen that it's not optional. And then he says that each one of you should know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. A few things we can take from verse 5. He's telling us not to be like the Gentiles. How are the Gentiles? And if you, know, if you don't know the Gentiles, it's pretty much pagans, people who do not know God. That's not a very familiar word these days. We don't use that word very much, but if you read the Bible, you'll see that it's a word that's used over and over. Gentiles mean people who do not know God. And so he says, Gentiles are controlled by their lust. Why? Because they do not know God. What is the implication for Christians? Why is he telling them to abstain from sexual immorality? Why am I telling you not to go on the internet and watch pornography? It's because you know God. If you do not know God, this does not apply to you. Not watching pornography will not make you a Christian. Not watching pornography will not please God. The, re the world is trying that. You know, I... Uh, watched a video while I was preparing. It was a TED talk. Uh, this guy, and you know, I feel sorry for him, but he's lost. He's talking about his struggle with pornography and talking about his fight with it. And he said, you know, one solution that I found was just confessing it to others, telling others. So he's serious. He wants to fight it. He wants to remove the shame for pornography. He's going to tell others, and that is supposed to help him. There are many programs that, you know, five steps, ten steps, how to stop watching pornography. Paul says here that you know God. The knowledge of God should stop you from sinning against God. Does anybody come to mind when you think about sinning against God in this kind of sin? Think of Joseph. What did he say? How can I sin how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph knew God when Potiphar's wife, you know, the Bible says that Joseph was a good-looking young man. And I think Potiphar's wife was also very beautiful. You know, in those times, you're a powerful, you found the most beautiful girl you could find, and you married her. So she's beautiful. Uh, Joseph is very handsome. And she says, why don't we sleep together? She, Tell, told him over and over, come, lie with me. Joseph says, say, no, how can I sin against God? He had a knowledge she did not. You can imagine how she was, she couldn't understand. Joseph, why not? He had a God that she did not have. Her God was pleasing herself. No matter what it took, and in this case, she's pleasing her flesh, Joseph how to please the Lord. He loved the Lord. He knew the Lord. So he did not want to please his own flesh. So here Paul says, you cannot be led by your flesh because what? You know the Lord. Now, do you know the Lord? Brothers, we are those who know the Lord. Then, 
verse 6, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Now, before we look at this, I think it's also important to go back to verse 1. You know, the, Paul is asking, is urging them, and he repeats a phrase that I want us to focus on. Finally then, brothers, as we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. So what Paul is saying, he's saying, asking, urging in the Lord. He's not asking in his own authority, nor is he asking them to do it in the flesh. It's in the Lord. If you keep reading, verse 2 repeats the same phrase. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave them instructions, and they were through who? The Lord. Now, I think this is very important. Because as we've seen, this demand, this asking, this urging is not directed towards those who do not know the Lord. It's directed towards those who know the Lord. So it's very important that we understand that he's talking to people who are in the Lord. And I just want to read off some verses to you that speak of those who know the Lord. I think you don't have to turn there, but Romans 6 is a great example. You know, verse 4, walk in newness of life. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we will no longer be enslaved to sin. Verse 11, so you, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. For sin will have no dominion over you. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sins have become obedient from the hurt and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify. By the way, I'm reading verses from the Bible. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desire. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Did you hear some words that were repeated? Put to death, sacrifice, you are no longer you are now. You are no longer slave to sin. You are slaves of righteousness. You have crucified your body. Put your flesh to death. And why is this important? We must understand God does not come to man and say, you overcome sin. You overcome the flesh. No, he says, you have overcome through Jesus Christ. And we must believe that and walk in that. And then he says, I've given you my spirit. Now, by my spirit, put to death what is earthly in you. I think that's very important because no one here can stand against sin. It's only through the Lord. So there are not strong Christians, weak Christians. There are only those who are believing the words of the Bible and they're not falling to this sin. So you cannot plead your weakness. And I'm wanting to emphasize this because I think it's Jeff who said a couple of weeks ago that we can hide, hide this word behind this word struggle. I am struggling. What does that mean? I am weak. Does the Lord tell you to use your strength to fight against sin? It's his spirit. So is the spirit of the Lord weak? It is not. 
So all we need to do is have faith in what the Lord has said, not give any excuses, and believe that if he's called us to put this sin to death, we will, not through our own strength, but through his spirit. So we must understand how we fight. We do not fight in the strength of the flesh. We fight in the strength of the Lord. And if we do so, then we have no excuse. We cannot plead our weakness our struggle, because the Lord is not weak. And then, now, we can go to verse 6. that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warn you. Now, I think this verse might be interpreted in different ways, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. You know, is he talking about person to person? I think that's a possibility. Is he talking about a person sinning against the church? I think that's a possibility. And I want to look at those two. Let's take the first one. Let's say in marriage, if a husband is watching pornography, if a wife is watching pornography, would you all agree with me that whoever is watching is sinning against their brother or sister? Now, Look at the great weakness of calling upon the name of the Lord, calling yourself a Christian. And let me start with a husband. You're a husband and go hide in your room and watch pornography. How can you love your wife as the church, as Christ loved the church, if you're going to hide and sin? How can you lead her? It's impossible. How will you lead her? You're sinning. Are you going to lead her in sin? That's the only thing you can do. Do you see the weakness of sinning against our brother or sister? Brethren, if you call yourself a Christian, we just read, you are not a slave to sin, and you cannot be a slave to sin. If you are a slave to sin, then you're not a Christian. If you believe yourself to be a Christian, then you must believe what the Lord says about you. And as we heard and have seen, this is not only applicable to men. Women are falling and do fall into the same sin. And I looked at some statistics, the same website that publishes its uh, pornography views. You know, men, women are about 30, 40%. I thought it might be 10. But obviously I was wrong. But women are not holier than men. Men are not holier than women. There is only one holy, and that's the Lord. And if you're a woman, you should not feel that what should I say? More ashamed because you're a woman? No, you should feel ashamed because you're sinning against God. What about sinning against the church? You know, there is an example that stands out in the Old Testament, and that's the example of Achan. You know, you know what happened to the story? Joshua sends men over to go fight, and they lose. And Joshua cannot understand. He says, how? Israel has turned its back against its enemies. And God says, I will not be there. I will not give you my presence until you take out the sin amongst you. And Achan was the man who had taken idols and hid them in his tent. So God says, you cannot have me and your idols. You cannot have God in pornography. You cannot have God in sin. You're either a slave of God or a slave of sin. 
And why do I bring up that example? Brethren, you know, we come here, we love each other, we pray for one another, we have missionaries that we pray for, we want God to be known and honored, not only among the nations, but here in San Antonio. You know how many ministries we have. And then you go sin. Are you not sinning against us? Are you not sinning against the body? Are you costing the presence of God to this church? And I do not say that to condemn you, but I'm saying that, that you see the great wickedness of your sin and repent and turn. We pray for revival, and yet we go in our rooms, hide, watch pornography. How can you do that? First, confess your sins. Turn from our sins. Let's read the final verse. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. I think this verse stopped me when I was preparing. You know, if you read the whole letter in 1 Thessalonians, it's a very positive letter. Paul has great things to say about them. As Mike has been preaching, it's not like the letter of 1 Corinthians. Think if you read that letter, there is a lot going on, a lot of sin. But this letter, it's been positive so far. They are working well, as we already saw. He's only asking them to do so more and more. But then you come to verse 8, and he says, Whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit. Paul, why will they disregard you? Why will they not listen? They've been listening. You have only great things to say about them. But now, it seems like Paul, I don't know what we want to call it. Is he changing his tone? Is he becoming defensive? Whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God. Paul is saying, if you disregard what I'm saying, you're not disregarding me. You're disregarding God. And that's very important. See, we can choose to agree or disagree on whatever we like. You know, I can say, hey, Brother Jonathan, you have this view on, you know, pick a topic and I have this view and we can disagree and be okay and keep going. But we do not want to disagree with God. You do not want to disregard God's word. And I think this is also a danger in our church and I think the history proves it. Now, if you've been here for even a short amount of time, you know that there is strong preaching against sin, all kinds of sin from this pulpit. Our elders have been very faithful to give us the whole counsel of God. We do not have false prophets like in the days of Jeremiah. They said, peace, peace, when there is no peace. We are not told from this pulpit that you can be a slave to sin and be okay and be, have peace with God. Why am I saying that? Because I think some people sit back and disregard what is said. They hear it. That does not apply to me. I am okay. I have peace with God. That sin you're talking about? I have faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, no. It's Jesus Christ who's speaking to you. If you disregard God, if you disregard the Lord, then there is no peace for you. And I want to plead with you. I think some of you, maybe you've confessed to the elders or, or your friends, and, and it's not a hidden sin. But I should also say that that does not put you in a safe place. You will not be saved because you confessed. 
you'll be saved because you turned away. But to those of you who are even now thinking, what is he saying? I don't want to listen to him. That does not apply to me. You know what I'm saying is true because time after time, unfortunately, sadly, we find out here's a brother, here's a sister. They've been living in sin and they thought they were fine. You have to wonder. They come here, sit down, listen to preaching against sin and then go home, continue as if nothing has happened. What's going on in their head? They're just disregarding God. So I think it's very important that we do not disregard the word of God. If you've done so until now, please come into the light. And I do not mean the light of telling other people your sin. Coming into the light of God's word, what it says about sinners, about slaves to sin, and what it says about being a Christian. You cannot be a slave to sin. You're a slave to righteousness. So you must put that deed to death. Please do not disregard. You know, while I was preparing, I also came across, I think you probably know him, most of you know him, Ravi Zacharias. You know his life. You know, it's very unfortunate or sad. I have a biography of Leonard Ravenhill, and if you know Leonard Ravenhill was a man of God, holy man of God. And in the back, you know, there is people who endorse the book. You have Paul Washer, you have Ravi Zacharias, and other men. He fooled everyone. No one knew the kind. Maybe I should first say, if you don't know him, he was a famous man. Apologetics was his specialty, if you'd say so. We have friends. Maybe we are the ones. We looked up to him. And his words seemed right. But his life was darkness. And no one knew. I don't know if you've taken the time to read the report that came afterwards. Maybe you have not. There is no doubt he did not know the Lord. The kind of things that he did. And yet, outside, he lived well. I mean, why am I saying this? No one, no one knows your heart except God. You might fool everyone else, but God knows and sees your heart. And you must see, do you, do you see the foolishness of hiding your sins? You are more afraid of men than God. Because we here do not know that you're living in sin. You think you're safe. But God knows it all. So that only should condemn you and should judge you that you are afraid of man rather than God. So when I speak of coming in the light, of leaving your sin behind, I'm not only saying that you tell man. I'm saying remove the blinds. Believe what God says. Believe that he's with you in secret, that you cannot hide anything from him, and do not disregard what he says about you. We have to realize, brethren, you have to realize when God says this, God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He's only saying this, that he might set you free. And finally... I don't think we can uh, talk about sexual immorality without talking about David. Let's turn to 2 Samuel. Second Samuel twelve. Now I think we, we will not read the whole chapter. 
but we are all familiar with the sin of David. It's written for us. God did not hide it. A man who's responsible for a lot of the Psalms. You know, Jesus is called the son of David. God is not ashamed to own him as his son. But his sin is written for all of us to see. We know what he did. We know what great length he went to. Killed Uriah. He, I think I think it's uh, maybe James who mentioned it. I don't know if it was last week, but he made me just go back and read and think about it again. You know what steps he had to go through? Hide. He brought Uriah over after he had committed adultery. He wanted David wanted to hide his sin. He brings Uriah. You know, go home. You know, he's been in battle. He hasn't seen his wife for a long time. So he hopes that by going home, Uriah is going to know his wife. And, you know, when the child is born, they're not going to think that it's David. It's going to be Uriah's wife. Uriah refuses. He makes him drunk. David is trying. He's hiding his sin. He's going to great lengths. Uriah refuses. And David finally does what? orders for the death of Uriah. Now, what is God's response to all of this? You know, we've, we've seen that what the Christian life ought to be, what relationship the Christian ought to have with sexual immorality, no relationship. That's what the Bible says. It should not even be named among us. It's not proper among us. We are saints. We're not slaves to sin. Let's start from verse 7. You know, after Nathan tells him, he says, Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. If this were too little, I would, I would add to you as much more. Now, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? Do you see the words of God to, jo to David? David has despised the Lord. That's why Paul said, you cannot live like the Gentiles. God does, not go to, God does not send a prophet to a Gentile and say, why have you despised the Lord in sinning this way? No, their whole lives is an abomination to the Lord. It's not just by cleaning this part off that God is pleased with you. But if you know the Lord, God says, verse 9 again, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? Jump to verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. The same word comes back again. You have despised me, David. You know me. You have a new heart, David. You have my spirit. You're not like the Gentiles who do not know me. Why have you despised me, David? God is not happy. And he's not happy because David knows him. Jump to verse 14. Nevertheless, because by this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord. Do you see the same pardon emerging again? You have utterly scorned the Lord. Do you think God just passed over the sin of David? No, he didn't. He said, David, you've utterly scorned me. God cannot use any stronger language than that. You have spit in my face, David. That's what God is saying. And that's because you know me. You know, Jesus with the heathen spitting in his face and uh, crucifying him on the flesh, he said, forgive them. They don't know what they do. 
God says, David, you know what you did. You know my face. You worship me, David, and then you spit in my face. You've utterly scorned me. That's the word David, God uses, telling David his sin. Now, do you see the great wickedness of your sin? If you call yourself a Christian, you're despising the Lord, utterly scorning him in his face, spitting in his face, spitting in the face of the church of your wife or husband. Turn from your sin, and you must turn. Now, I think, unfortunately, I haven't heard this here, but I've certainly heard it in my Christian life. You know, people use David's sin as an excuse for sinning. I mean, David sinned. Why not I? Why not continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that what the Bible says? The Bible says, by no means. And I think it's in 1 Kings 15, we are told of the life of David. You don't have to turn there. But David was not a sexual immoral person. David was not ungodly. David was a holy man. Did he fall? Yes. Was God pleased? No. This is what God says about him. He says, David, maybe we should turn there as our last, 1 Kings 5, 1 Kings 15, I should say. Uh, let's read from verse 4, 1 Kings 15, verse 4 and 5. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp. In, are you guys there? I'll wait. 1 Kings 15. First Kings 15, 4 and 5. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him and establishing Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. See verse 5. The Lord did not... Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. I think this is an important verse, especially, and you should not be thinking this way. If you look at the sins of the saints and you think that excuses you, no saints has ever been a slave to sin. David was not a slave to his passion. And this verse tells us, and the life of David tells us, he was a holy man. But why would you look at the sin of David and comfort yourself? Are you justified because other men sin? I think, unfortunately, I think we can compare ourselves with others and say, well, so and so struggles, so-and-so struggles, so I should be okay. That is not what the Bible says. You will all go to hell if you're slave to your passions. You're not justified by the sins of others. You're justified by the Lord. And the Lord has given you His Spirit. He has said, put it to death. You put it to death by my spirit, not your own strength. So brothers, I, especially you who are sinning in this way, believe what the Lord says. He does not tell you to fight in your own strength. 
That's why you have no excuse. He says, fight in my strength. Let's pray. Oh, Father, Lord, clean your church. Father, Lord, your Bible says that these things, Lord, pornography should not even be named among us. Lord, please, clean. Lord, Lord, in those who are in sin, Lord, help them not to justify themselves. Help them not to disregard the word of God. Let them see what your words say and believe it, Lord. Lord, please glorify yourself in our bodies, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.